So at last, let's discuss the urea cycle. So where does the cycle actually take place and why does it take place in the first place? So the urea cycle occurs predominantly in our hepatocytes in our liver cells and to a smaller extent also takes place in our kidneys. So why does it actually take place? Well, the urea cycle gives us a way to transform a toxic byproduct of amino acid metabolism, namely ammonia, into a less toxic form urea that can then be mobilized and transported to the kidneys where the kidneys excrete the urea via urine. So that's what the urea cycle is. Now let's take a look at the details of this cycle and let's begin by summarizing the cycle on this side and then let's take a look at the details of each step. So ultimately we can break down the cycle into five steps. Two of these steps, step one and two, take place in the matrix of the mitochondria of that liver cell and the other three steps, three, four and five, take place in the cytoplasm of that hepatocyte, the liver cell. So let's suppose we have metabolism of amino acids that takes place inside the hepatocyte. Now this also takes place outside the liver, but ultimately all the ammonium ends up inside the liver, inside the matrix of that mitochondria. And so the extra ammonium basically is used, it's combined with carbon dioxide that comes from bicarbonate as we'll see in just a moment and using two ATP molecules we form a high energy molecule, a molecule that has a high transfer potential known as carbamoyl phosphate. Now, this takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. We have an amino acid called ornithine that actually formed in step five of the urea cycle that moves into the matrix of the mitochondria and the ornithine is combined with the carbamoyl acid or the, carb the carbamoyl phosphate to form the citrulline. And citrulline is yet another amino acid. So ultimately, even though these two are amino acids, they're not actually used in protein synthesis. Remember, these aren't part of the 20 amino acids that our body uses to synthesize proteins. Now, once we form citrulline in step two, that moves into the cytoplasm of the cell. And in the cytoplasm, we combine the citrulline with aspartate to form arginosuccinate. Now, an important point must be made about step three. So we saw that the first amino group that ends up in the urea came from this free ammonium. But the second amino group that ends up on the urea comes from aspartate. Now, once we form arginosuccinate, that is then broken down into arginine and fumarate. So what happens in step four? So ultimately, the second amino group that came from aspartate ends up on the arginine when this reaction happens. But the carbon skeleton that was found on the aspartate essentially ends up on the fumarate. In fact, the carbon skeleton of the aspartate is fumarate. Now, fumarate is important because fumarate is the link, it the, it's the bridge between the urea cycle and gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose. So remember, in a liver, we have gluconeogenesis. And in gluconeogenesis, we can ultimately form malate from fumarate. And malate is transformed in gluconeogenesis to oxaloacetate. And it's oxaloacetate that is used to form glucose. So we see that link, the bridge, between urea cycle and gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose, is this fumarate. So we recycle the carbon skeleton and aspartate to fumarate and then use that to form glucose in gluconeogenesis. But the nitrogen containing group that ends up on the arginosuccinate as a result of the aspartate stays on the molecule to form arginine. Now, in the final step, step five, where we form the urea, we essentially hydrolyze the arginine by using a water molecule. We remove that urea 
and we also form the ornithine, the amino acid that ultimately is recycled back into the matrix of the mitochondria to ultimately help this cycle continue taking place. So if we look on this molecule, the oxygen shown in blue came from the water, this carbon came from this carbon dioxide, this nitrogen here came from the aspartate, and this nitrogen came from this free ammonium. So once we form the urea, it then moves via the bloodstream to our kidneys, and the kidneys ultimately excrete that via urine. Now, let's actually look at the details of each one of these steps, and let's begin with step number one. So in step number one, the enzyme that catalyzes this step is carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. So this carbamoyl phosphate synthetase ultimately utilizes two ATP, two ATPs in this three-step process. So we begin with a carbon dioxide, but actually the carbon dioxide is in the form of bicarbonate. So remember, carbon dioxide in our body exists as bicarbonate. Now, bicarbonate is a stable molecule, and we have to increase its energy, and that's where we use the first ATP. So we phosphorylate the carbon to form carboxyphosphate, and now this is high enough in energy to actually react with our ammonia. Now notice I said ammonia and not ammonium. Why is that? Well, because the carbamoyl phosphate synthetase uses the ammonia as a substrate and not ammonium. So rem remember, inside our body, we have ammonium that exists in somewhat of an equilibrium with its ammonia. And so ammonium transforms into ammonia, and then that is used as a substrate by carbamoyl phosphate synthetase to basically combine this ammonia with this um, carbon here, kicking off this orthophosphate, and so we form the carbamic acid. And then the second ATP comes into play, and this basically attaches on, the phosphate here attaches onto this oxygen to basically form the carbamoyl phosphate as we have it here. And so this molecule is high in energy, it has a high transfer potential because of this anhydride bond shown here. And so what that means is this molecule is now ready to react with the ornithine in step number two. But before we go to step number two, I have to mention that this carbamoyl phosphate synthetase enzyme will only become active in the presence of a, mo in the presence of a molecule known as N-acetylglutamate. So we have to have N-acetylglutamate to actually activate the carbamoyl phosphate synthetase to allow it to undergo these reactions and produce carbamoyl phosphate. And because this enzyme lies in the matrix of the mitochondria, this step takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, step two also takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria because the enzyme ornithine transcarbamoylase lies in the matrix of the mitochondria. And so what this enzyme does is it takes this product of reaction one and it transfers this carbamoyl group kicking off the orthophosphate, it transfers this group onto ornithine to form citrulline. So this is what ornithine looks like. And ultimately, this group here, minus this oxygen and this phosphate group, is transported onto this nitrogen of the ornithine to form the citrulline. And then the citrulline moves into the cytoplasm of the cell. So that's where we go to step three. So in step three, now we want to add the second amino group, and that comes from aspartate. So this is aspartate here. Ultimately, we want to transfer this group here. And so the enzyme arginine synthetase it uses an ATP, it hydrolyzes that ATP to form AMP and pyrophosphate, and that energy is used to form a bond between this nitrogen here and ultimately this carbon here, and we kick off this oxygen here. And so we form arginosuccinate. And now we have a positive charge that is, that is essentially delocalized among these three nitrogen atoms here. So once we form this, we also actually form this pyrophosphate. And the pyrophosphate, because it's unstable, will actually hydrolyze 
And so what that means is we not only use one ATP in this step, but we actually use two equivalent ATP molecules because the hydrolysis of pyrophosphate basically is equivalent to hydrolyzing a single ATP molecule. And so here we actually use two and not one ATP molecules. So once we form arginosuccinate, that is then used in step four. And so now what we want to use is, we want to basically transform or remove the carbon skeleton that came from aspartate. So we want to keep this nitrogen group shown here on this structure, but we want to remove this carbon skeleton and recycle that carbon skeleton. And so that's what happens in step four the enzyme arginosuccinase basically catalyzes the removal of this carbon skeleton to form fumarate. And we also form arginine as shown here. Now the fumarate is again the link. It's the bridge between urea cycle and gluconeogenesis. This can be used by the liver cell, the hepatocyte, to actually form glucose. But arginine continues on to step five. And in step five, what we ultimately want to do here is we want to remove this group here. We want to attach an oxygen to form that urea. And the resulting carbon skeleton that is formed is that ornithine amino acid that ultimately goes back into the matrix and is reused to continue this urea cycle. And so the enzyme arginase uses a water molecule to essentially attack and hydrolyze this bond here, breaking this bond, forming the ornithine as well as that urea. And so we see the oxygen came from this water in step five, the carbon came from the bicarbonate in step one, this nitrogen came from step three, that aspartate, and this nitrogen essentially came from this step, also step one, the free ammonium. And so the urea is then transported into the bloodstream, moves into the kidneys, and it's removed by the kidneys via urine. Now, if we sum up all these steps, this is the net reaction that we get. So a single carbon dioxide molecule, a single free ammonium, two water molecules. So one water molecule came from here and the second water molecule came from transforming the carbon dioxide into bicarbonate. We have three ATPs and an aspartate. So two ATPs are used here and one ATP is used here. And we generate urea, two ADPs, we have an AMP, we have an orthophosphate, pyrophosphate, and fumarate. And as I said before, because we have the pyrophosphate and it basically breaks down, that's equivalent to using one more ATP. And so instead of having three total, we have four equivalent ATPs used per one cycle of urea. And we also generate that fumarate, which is then used by the liver to potentially form glucose molecules via gluconeogenesis. So this is the urea cycle, the method by which our body, the liver specifically, is able to transform the toxic byproduct of amino acid metabolism, the free ammonium, into a less toxic urea form, which is then mobilized, delivered to our kidneys, and excreted via the kidneys via our urine.